you want really good coffee to take on your next adventure, use CS Instant Coffee. You can find out more about them at csinstant.coffee. And right, and it's light there. There's a, an area light. So I'm laying down, have my bear spray out. And we had been told that that's kind of like Grizzly Alley because it's close to Yellowstone. And, mm. and so I'm, I'm laying down there and asleep and I feel something like walking across my my legs. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet. We interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun. I love talking about the Tour Divide. In fact, we haven't talked about it in a while, but we we will be talking about it in today's episode. And if you don't know what that is, it's just this awesome underground race. It's getting more popular. It's been around a little while now, but it's from Banff, Banff, which is B-A-N-F-F, Alberta, Canada. And look that up if you don't know what it is. It's got to be one of the prettiest mountain towns in the world. So it starts there, and it goes along the Great Divide mountain bike route, but it's as close to the Continental Divide Trail as you can be, but for bicycles. So it's pretty much like the Continental Divide Trail, but for bikes. The race is from the beginning, which is in Banff, all the way to the Mexican border, 2,750 miles. And the winners doing this whole trail in 13 to 14 days uh, I took uh, quite a bit longer, but uh, I, it was still very difficult for, for the pace I did it. it. It's not, you know, the craziest thing out there. It's pretty crazy, but it's one of those adventures that's, to me, just really stands out. One, because, you know, I've, I've done it. Two, be, it just always did, even before I'd done it, just something that I always wanted to do. And uh, Marty here didn't do his first one until he was 60 years old. How impressive is that? to To be 60 and say you know what, I'm going to do what's considered the hardest mountain bike race in the world. 2020 will be his sixth year in a row, and he's completed it half those times. So he's completed it three out of five times and going for four out of six times. In the off-season, as we'll hear, Marty works at a garden center, and uh, just two totally different worlds to me. But I I love it. I love folks that are seemingly normal and common and, you know, maybe not terribly exciting. And then they have this thing about them that, you know, is just so different and so exciting and so unique. So I hope you enjoy Marty's story. He's a great guy. And you can follow him at his website, which is bucketride.bike. And on Instagram at gotchili, like G-O-T-C-H-I-L-E, to where where he'll be posting. And he writes a lot about the Tour Divide. So if you need some, you know, want to do some research and read some stories, I really highly recommend checking out bucketride.bike. All right, enough of me talking. Let's get in the episode. Hey, folks, welcome to the show. Uh, today we've got a great guest. We were talking about the Tour Divide, you know, one of my favorite topics. We don't get to talk about it, or we haven't talked about it in a while. But uh, yeah, on today to to bring up an old topic, but in a fresh light, is Marty Johnson. Marty, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, glad to be a part of it. I've listened to a few of the episodes and uh, always enjoy talking about the divide. Oh man, so so you know we were just talking, but you know when you're not out there doing the divide you are running a, a gardening center and, and where is that based out of where where's home for you uh wichita kansas we've got uh two retail stores and then one of our locations is a distribution center where we sell basically landscaping supplies to landscape companies lawn service companies my son's president of the the company now which uh is good for me to go off and do some things i want to do do people, I mean, do you talk about it a lot at, at, at work and are people just blown away? Uh, yeah, they're, they're interested in it. They're, it's, I guess, different in a lot of ways, but, and we'll talk about it later. You know, the divide is similar to many things in our lives that we all, all deal with, but, you know, we've got our busy season in the spring and, and then we hit, we hit it hard and, 
Then other times of the year, it's slower, like you know, in the winter time and in the summer. So it does enable me to get away. But uh, it, you know, it takes all of our attention some of the time of the year, and other time of the years, it's you know, it's it's not as much. So. So when you when you're attempting the divide, it seems like you go right out of right into busy season with with work, and then you jump right on the divide. It's got to be wild. Yeah, it, it is, and and it's you know our our busy time, like I say, is the spring. And of course, the divide starts that second Friday in June every year. I'd love to be spending the whole spring out training and being ready to go, and and uh, but it it's it's hard to get away because of work to go and and train. Um, again, my, I say, I've turned over a lot of those responsibilities to, to family and, and, and employees. So I am able to, to go do some events, but yeah, it is, it's hard to get out and get trained. And then I say it's April and May is like my dad always said, it's, it's the Super Bowl for us. And then a complete different focus with, uh, with the tour divide. No kid, and lot, lots of plants out there though. Still, lots of flowers coming oh, out. And, so and, sure. and that's, you know, that's the thing I, I like about it. You know, we all look at the geography is so it's so varied. I mean, you, you've seen it, and but it's just it's just so you know the mountains and everything. But but the plants is something that I you were all stopping taking pictures, and I met out there in the middle of the the Great Basin, down on my hands and knees, taking a picture of this this little flower and. Yeah, the, the plants really are, are part of the attraction for me. And and not only the flowers, but the, you know, the conifers, the, you know, the evergreens. It's just, you know, so varied uh, the whole way, but it's just part of the, of the attraction for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's, I mean, there's so much on, on an experience like that. And I, I mentioned, I'm going to mention, you know, what the tour divide is for all the new listeners, or if you need a refresher for everyone um, that's new to the show. But, you know, it's such a wild idea, man. And you're planning to do it again this year in 2020 for your sixth time at the age of 65. When, 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 what, what year was the first year you did it? And how did that idea come about? 2015 was, was the first year that I attempted it. You know, I've just gone back every year and, and started again. And I finished it that first year. And when you finish it, just like a lot of adventures, you know, it's, you get to the end, it's, it's bittersweet because it's, you know, you've been, you spent weeks or a month of your life doing this hike or bike or whatever it is, and you're ready for it to be over. But then on the other hand, it's like, it's going to be over, you know? Yeah. So, um, over. yeah. And, you know, some people say, well, you're going to do it again. And that first year I said, you know, if a good friend wants to go do it with me, they're going to have to twist my arm pretty hard to, for me to go back and do this again. But if, you know, if my son or daughter wanted to do it, I, you know, I, I sign up in a heartbeat. A lot of these events, it just pulls at you, you know, you, you get somewhat recovered from it and then you get, you know, four or six months out from it. Then I, I mean, all you do is you think about it every day. Absolutely. You, you get to where you just, you can't wait to, to get back. So you, your first year was 2015, meaning this will be your sixth time, but you were 60 when you started it, when you first attempted it and finished it, correct? Right. Yeah. I was 60 years old and, you know, I was active, you know, working outside all the time. I, you know, I've stayed in pretty good shape, but I wasn't in sports a lot growing up. We were myself, my two brothers, we lived next to the garden center. We were, we were working at the garden center. And, and, wow. uh, so, you know, I never, I didn't play football, baseball. I didn't hunt and fish, but, you know, I liked just being outside and, so I, you know, like a lot of us, you know, we, the great divide mountain bike race, I think was early on. And yeah. I think maybe on MTV cast, Joe was, you know, had the call call-ins and I think that's maybe where I first heard about it. And then there was an article in outside magazine. And of course, then the documentary came out and, and you just like, you know, maybe I can do that sometime. And a friend of mine who does ultras, you know, runs and triathlons and, we kind of talked about it. it's like well you know maybe let's let's do a state of year and so funny i decided well i'm gonna i'm gonna do it. it was in 14 it's like i'm gonna do it next year and i just approached it it's like you know I'll, I'll go as far as i can you know i i uh did some longer ride did race across texas in in 14 that was 850 miles in eight days i think and all self-contained and it's like well okay you know maybe i can do it i didn't you know no pressure on myself it's just like you know if i don't make i don't make it it's like you know i I know i wasn't going to be very fast but you know people say well you know how long is it going to take you it's like i don't know i figured you know 100 miles a day 
2,800 miles, maybe a month. And so, mm-hmm. man, that's, you know, it's about where I've been. So, no, I made it that first year and, and finished on day 28 or 29 and then went back in 16 and I had a meeting to go to in Denver and put a little more pressure on myself. It's like if I could do it in 26 or seven days, I can make my meeting. And I got down, you, know, you get to New Mexico and had some mud and some had some slower days. And so I, I bailed it at Cuba and made my meeting. And, and, and after that, you know, I felt, I mean, I regretted, you know, pulling out that year. It's like, you know, we can spend our lives going to meetings, but (laughs) yeah, you know, know, it's, it's this, you know, I missed an opportunity to finish again. So then I went back in in 17 and there was a, a Bobby Smith from Winfield, Kansas, a friend of mine. He, he, um, decided to do it and he and i rode together quite a bit on, on it and finished in 17 and then then in 18 i thought well you know on the dubai it's like you know you you leave bamf and it's it's wet and cold every year i'd leave it, it was always raining mm-hmm. at, at the start and so it's like um, i'm gonna start down in new mexico i'm from kansas you know i'm i'm thinking you know i I ride in the heat. And so I, I caught the train, went to Albuquerque and a friend took me to Antelope Wells and took off. And, and I lasted four days in 18. I, it, it got hot. And I just, by that time my head wasn't in it. And like I said, my friend Bill is in Albuquerque and I had an out and I, and I took it. And then of course that one I regretted too. So then went back last year in, in 19 and, and finished it again. Then just like from now, just probably <laughs> probably do it every year as long as I can you know I'm fortunate to be able to and so I'll just you know enjoy it and just keep going back and doing it <laughs> you just say yeah you act like it's no big deal man I mean this is like the hardest thing I've ever done <laughs> and I was well, I was I was pretty young when I did it but uh I mean it was just such an such an adventure in 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 such a it was such a mental game the whole time like I don't know if I can do this I don't you know what I mean? Being young and not probably as disciplined in life at that point. And, uh, gosh, it was just such a whirlwind every day. It felt like just a, a total yeah. adventure of no, not knowing what was going to happen, but I like to just to come back and do it over and over and over again, man, that's, that's, I, I am not there in life. Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's, there's a couple things. I, my gut feeling is there's a higher percentage of riders that finish that are 40 and over than 40 and under. I definitely agree. I think it's just what you say. You know, when you're 40 and over, you know, you're for the most part, your families are raised. You, you've gone through more life challenges. You're you're glad to be out there. Yeah, we're racing it. Our our goal is is to just finish it within the rules. And they, you know, they say it's the hardest mountain bike race in the world. Or I'm not gonna say it's not hard because it is, but it's just long. You're just riding every day, not recovered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you can do a, a half marathon or, or whatever, and then you can go and recover and do another one a few days later. But, you know, on the divide, it's like you're just, even from the start, you're competing not recovered and not well fed and probably not well hydrated and sleeping cold and yeah. all that. Not not doing too good uh, all, yeah. all around, it sounds like. <laughs> and, you know, th- this year I was talking to, uh, in Brush Mountain Lodge to, to Josh and Sophie and they had both pulled out and ended up back at, at Brush Mountain Lodge and they were spending some time. And it, it was, it was so fun spending time with those guys. It was, it was like old home week almost. And, you know, those, those guys, you, I, I'd met them and we had talked, but you know, you feel like you're almost this tribe, but because, you know, we were a, a family now, but we were talking up there in Brush Mountain. It's like, you know, we, we really ought to just tour this thing, not race it. And just you oh, know, yeah. get to some place, make make dinner, have a campfire because it was so much fun there at Brush Mountain, sitting around the campfire, eating pizza and drinking a beer. It's like you know, you know, get up in the morning, make coffee, and if you want to go off off course, you go off course. And then on the other hand, you know, I'm still trying to do it in 25 days, so you keep you know chasing that carrot out there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've heard a lot of people say, if you could do it again, what would you do? And a lot of them. So I'd take a lot more stuff. I would go a lot slower and I'd bring a fishing pole because there is just so, there's so much you could stop and explore every day because it's, it really is, you're, you're really out there in the wilderness, a lot of it. And it's just pristine. It's a lot of, it's just very pristine. But, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, being, 
being born and raised in in Kansas and being third generation um, running, it's the same gardening center for the your third generation, correct? Yes, I'm third generation. Right. Yeah. What, what you know? Were were was your parents were they adventurous like this? Because I know a lot of people that I'm from a small town in Florida, and there's a lot of you know second, third, fourth generations companies, and I just feel like you know it, it very rare do you find somebody that just decides to do something so out of the box like this um do you, do, do you come from a, a, a family like this or are you kind of like a black sheep in your community of like oh yeah marty goes out every summer and does that crazy ride thing but you well know, he yeah comes back <laughs> yeah th- well there's certainly that i tell people well i wasn't one of the a students you know i, I have, okay I, have, I haven't learned but you know my my grandfather he he came up to uh to kansas in a covered wagon from oklahoma and my dad, he was, he was older. He was born in 16. So I mean, he was older when we were growing up and, uh, was in, in world war II. And he said, you know, I spent, you know, two or three years in a pup tent in Germany. And so camping wasn't his idea of fun. Right. Um, you know, we, we were in scouts and I, you know, I really liked, you know, the scouting and the camp outs, you know, going to Philmont and, and all that. So I, I really liked that. And my family wasn't campers growing up, but um, my son was in scouts. It, it was an activity that we did. So no, it wasn't something that, I mean, I wasn't out all the time growing up with, with my family doing adventures. Well, what, what do you think it is about the tour divide that, that draws you um, back every year? Uh like we talked about the, the scenery, the, the, the places that, that you see and, and just, and, and it's so varied and people ask, you know, what's the, your favorite parts? Like, I, I don't know. It's Canadian Rockies are just, you know, those majestic jagged mountaintops, you know, down to the desert of the Southwest. They're also diverse and just, I guess, just experiencing that again. And then, and then, you know, the, the people that, that you meet to mention you can hang out in Banff and, you know, rub shoulders with, you know, people that have won this thing. You know, they're in our eyes, they're the elite athletes of this world, you know, not the people we're watching on TV. So being able to, you know, rub shoulders with them and just, and it, it may just be for, you know, an hour or two, but just making those connections and then the people along the way that, approach you and you know a lot of them they know what you're doing there's in 15 i was in breckenridge and walking down getting ready to eat lunch in this cafe and like i say you you look like you're from mars you know you've got yeah. this head on and your bike and walking down the you know this tourist town and this guy walks up and you know i'm like i said i'm i'm not fast and but this guy walks up and goes hey are you marty and i, I kind of look over at him it's like yeah well i've been following the divide i knew you were in town and wow. just wanted to come out here and see and you know just people that you know that you'll be riding along and there'll be people that'll ride by and just you know give you a thumbs up so they know what you're doing so you know it's just kind of the whole deal it's just you know yeah it, it's tough you'll be riding along and it's like oh my gosh you know what am i doing out here i've done this thing how many times and you know, you hurt and you're sore and it's like, you know, I could be home in my swimming pool and, and hanging out, but then you turn around a corner and, and there's just, you know, in the basin or wherever. And this, you think, Oh, this is the most beautiful place I've ever been to. I can't wait to get back here next year. Hmm. Is, is there an experience you've had out there that you could point to that kind of illustrates that maybe, maybe a very memorable experience that, that maybe you think about a lot? Can, can I make it any more vague than that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to think, you know, I'm trying to thought what you're going to ask. I'm trying to, you know, there's a lot of stories, a lot of yeah. fun stories. Well, this year there's a, uh, there's a little cabin. It's between Lincoln and but Helena. And it's just out in the middle of this field. And, and it's like a little hostel in this. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And 17, we stayed there that night, but never talked to anybody. And, but this year, I, I just try to keep going more this year when in the past you get someplace and I think you're riding with somebody, you, it, it would be like, hey, let's get a let's get a room tonight. And that first year, I think I spent about half the nights in a in a motel room. But, but this year it's like, I'm just, you know, I'm going to just and since then, it's like, I'm going to keep going. And I think this guy's name is John. And so I went up, I stopped there and he he comes out. Hey, you know, how, you know wants to find out my story and, and say, yeah, my, my wife, she's, she made some chicken salad sandwiches here and we've got, 
refrigerator here. We got pop, beer, whatever you want. And it's like, oh, you know, you're hungry. And so you stop there and, and eat. And it's like, well, you know, what do I owe you? Because, oh, you don't owe us anything. Just we want just pay it forward sometime. I guess experiences like that, that there's there's good people out there and from this year. And of course, the you know, cursing there at Brush Mountain Lodge. It's you yeah. know, it's defined <laughs> defining and you know, you leave Wyoming and then instantly you're in, you know, Colorado, the you know, mountains and everything. And that twelve miles up that road to her place is, you know, it's it's a push, especially in the afternoon. And I've gotten there at five in the afternoon i've gotten there at 10 o'clock at night and then she's there runs out hey marty you know gives you a hug and what 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 do you want you want you know you want some pizza or you know whatever so it's just um that's unreal man i you know i know everyone you're talking about just just because you know it's probably like anyone that does a through hike or something there's these people that are are kind of fixtures along the route and they obviously get a lot of joy out of it too, seeing these folks come through every year. And I know one thing when I, when I get to the point, I don't want to do this stuff anymore. I would love to be one of those people that can host and can support and yeah, can, can honestly, it, it, they're doing so much for you. They're like restoring your faith in humanity. Just knowing that some, this person out here in the woods, I'm going to be able to rely on, you know, in, yeah. in a couple of months. I just know they're going to be there. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. That's very well, cool. That, you know, another story too, is in that in 15 going into Hartsville, Colorado, mm-hmm. you know, leave, you leave Brackenridge, go over Boreas Pass, hit Como and go around. And, and it was, I was trying to beat a thunderstorm and it, it's, it's open out there. It was thundering and you see some lightning and you'd look ahead and try to find a place. Okay. If this starts coming down here, who am I going to hide out? And, and finally, you hit the highway, and it's like, okay, I can make it into Hartsville now. So I, I pull into Hartsville, and and it's like 8.30 at night. Well, the kitchen closes at 8. And oh, so, yeah. so, and but there was there was this guy in there playing pool, and I think his name was Chuck. And and Chuck had been at this bar a good part of the day. and, and That's a nice could, way of putting it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'd been playing pool and, and partaking there. And. I said, man, do you guys have any foods? No, the kitchen closed. And well, here, I've got this. I've got a cheeseburger and fries. Just, just take it. I'm just. You can have it. It's like, no, I, I'm not. I don't want to take it. No, go ahead and here. Just you can have it. I don't need it. So, wow. yeah, I'll take it. So you know, I, I eat it up. And then the next year, I, I was through there, and I mentioned that to him. I said, you know what? What was the deal? You know, with that guy? And he goes, well, that's just how people are around here. And I've always wished he would be there when I'd go back through there again. And, but you know, never is, but it's just, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere and just this little, little bar there and on the highway. Time for a quick message break. CS instant coffee is definitely the best instant coffee I've ever had. In fact, just out of convenience and how good it tastes, I decided for the last year, I've been taking it on every single adventure I go on from backpacking to bike tours, uh, just from convenience sake, it's really high quality and it keeps me from having to take a bunch of other equipment out in the woods. Uh, but it's not just for going out on adventures. My wife actually takes some to work every single day with her. She takes a couple packs, uh, to refill her coffee mug, uh, as a teacher. She doesn't have a ton of time to, um, have to, you know, make fresh, coffee all the time. So she just needs a little hot water, can pour the coffee in and she's ready to go for her next class and not waste a lot of time. So if you're crunched for time in your job, uh, I would definitely suggest giving it a shot because they have been huge supporters of the show for the last year. And I really appreciate everything they've done for us. And it would mean a lot to me to go support them. So if you're interested, go to csinstant.coffee and uh, support those who are supporting the show. It would go a long way. Thank you. All right, let's get back to the episode. It's an amazing experience. You know, is there, is is there, you know, having done it or, or having been out there five times and completed it three times, is, is there any place now that's kind of special to you that you look forward to maybe a region or, or a mountain range or a part of the trail that, that, that you really enjoy? Yeah, there one, and it's, it's been, um, I look forward to this place and that it's after you, uh, let me see, it's, it's going into Seeley Lake and you, that pass there. And then you do that, 
there's like a like a 180 you do, but you get there and you're looking at the Mission Mountain Range to the west. And it's I've always gotten there oh late in the afternoon. It's just I don't know. It's just almost a spiritual event, just sitting there and and looking out there, and it's just you know the range is probably I don't know thirty miles away, but just seeing that whole mountain range from the from that distance in the evening and and then the clouds is just is just special. Um, it, it was kind of weird this year too. In, in the basin, you, you're you're crossing the basin and and there's that that one spot that where's in the middle of nowhere, there's this old hood of a car. And it's like, how did, and I, I, you know, I'm guessing they're up there sledding with it or something, but there's this hood of this car, the top of it's probably, it wasn't like a 1950 Chevrolet, just a rounded hood. Yeah. It's all dented in, it's orange. And you think, you, know, how, you wonder what the story is with that thing. And, and, and this year I'm up there and, you know, you, you know, a bat where it's at, but in there, and it's like, you know, I couldn't find it. It's like, man, did someone take this thing? And I was almost starting to get disappointed. And sure enough, there it was, you know, <laughs> it just hadn't gone far enough, but you know, it's just crazy stuff like that, that you, you kind of, you know, look for and you've seen every year and, and look, look forward to seeing, cause you know, they're, they're kind of milestones and along the way that, that you look for. And, and Marshall Pass is another place that I, it's one of my favorite spots. And I don't know, I don't know what it is about it, but it's just, you know, leave Salida and was it Punch of Springs? And you go up that, well, it seems like it's 20 miles. It's probably six or seven miles up that grade. You know, it's paved, but it's just like, man, I can't wait to get off this road. It just takes forever. And then you hit the gravel on it. You know, it, it's up, it's a rail trail, but it's, um, you know, a lot of that's kind of Aspen line. And I just picture myself back a hundred years ago on this old narrow gauge railway going up this path is just, I know it's just another area that I look forward to every year. Hmm, I know, I know what you're talking about. Now, is there yeah. is there any place that you find particularly challenging or, or don't really love? You know, I was trying to think where the you know the hardest part is, and there's always a payoff for this long climb, and and there and there is, and you know, it's probably southern New Mexico and the Gila is probably as tough as any place. You know, it's it's about a hundred and some miles. There's there's really no water that you can collect or filter there's no streams out there really to speak of and there's no food and it's hot and it's um, probably new mexico that southern part's probably the the toughest part and and that that first year i did it we hit you know there's an alternate route that the true divide people take and it's on that continental divide trail they they run us over there and well that first year it was you know i'm tired and it was raining and, and it's hard to it's kind of hard to find the trail in that, in that campsite there. And I'm starting to go up it and it's like, Oh my, you know, my shoes are wet and I'm going up granite. And it's like, Oh, I think I'm going to go back and take the road. So I go, I go back and, and a, a friend of mine, Philip Burr is back there. So we, we start going around and um, I go a ways. It's, you know, it's probably a couple hours up to the top and this driver comes up and he says, you're, you're not on the route. It's like, I know goes, well, your buddy turned around and so I stopped and it's like, you know, I spent a month of my life out here doing this right. I need to go back and do the right thing. So yeah. I need to go back and do that, that trail. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm so glad I did. Cause so finally I go back and I, you know, I wasted probably four or five hours with that decision, but I get back up there on that trail. And once you get to the top, it's like, Again, at that point, it rained. It was really clear, and there's yucca up there blooming. And it's like, man, this is. I would have missed this spot had I done the wrong thing. I'm so glad that I, you know, came back and did the right thing. And and, and that's another tough spot. I mean, you know how it is. It's you know, it's hike a bike, and your bike weighs 60 pounds, and it's it's just a lot of walking up there, narrow. And and I and I'm not a good mountain biker anyway, so I'm not real comfortable doing that but you know then you get to you almost look forward to it now <laughs> so so what compelled you at the age of 60 to get out there and, and do this did you do you have a history of doing adventures like this or was this kind of out of the norm for you you know I, I i don't think i hadn't been doing a lot of these like i had you know the previous conversation with mike my friend the ultra athlete and he we had just talked about it and it's like you know i 
ridden gravel roads. I had done a few races around here, road races. I never was very fast. And, you know, I'd be on the podium when there were three people in my, in the, in the class, but, you know, we do, we've done, um, a lot of gravel out here, dirty Kansas and in, in the States. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to, it's a little bit, I guess I tried to do things maybe a little different maybe things that other people don't try. And I was at a point in my life where I, I, I could get away and do it. And, had talked to some people that, yeah, you know, there's people doing it that are in the 60s. So it's like, well, I'll give it a shot. And ended up finishing. Ended up finishing. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty, I mean, it's just impressive. I mean, how, were, were you, were you confident going into it? You, you, you said you didn't put yourself, you know, in a, in a bunch of, a bunch of pressure on yourself basically, but were you, how were you feeling going in? Yeah. I felt after the Texas ride, I, the year before that race across Texas, yep. you know, it was a hundred miles a day. So I, yeah, I figured I could, optimistic that i could do it um physically but i guess because i didn't put pressure on myself mentally it i was able to not let that get to me but you know it's it's definitely a big part of it that that mental part of it how, how many times do you foresee yourself doing it do you just enjoy doing it over and over again i, I do you know it's you know, a friend of mine that well bill that that picks me up and after that after 18, he said, you know, I guess you've got unfinished business. And it's, you know, if you think you can do it, you better do it because there will be a time when you can't. Do you feel compelled at all to, to do other things? Or do you just enjoy this, this route, this culture, this, uh, this group of people? Yeah, I think it's, it's the culture that I really enjoy and, and, and the people too. But, you know, I'm probably missing out on some things, some other ones. Yeah, but I, I've done Billy Rice's Grand Gravel. That'll be in, and upon doing it again. So that's 500, and 500 miles in March. So, I, you know, I do some intermediate events to get some other experiences. And But I guess that, you know, it's there's a certain comfort level having already done it that yeah. makes it easy to go back and do. And, you know, you've got the equipment for the most part. And, and there's... A certain amount of fun on any, any of these adventures is, of course, they always say, you know, this the journey, not the destination. And even, you know, part of the journey is the preparation for it, too. That's absolutely, you know, looking at the maps and, and all the, you know, the gear and just making sure everything's ready, ready to go. And, you know, a- after that, I guess you say, how long will you be doing it? After, after that Texas ride, I, my fingertips got numb and just being on my bike, I guess, for, hours a day and that and that's never gone away and fingers will get numb my hand will get numb and then i'll go do the, it'll get better during the year then i'll go ride again for a month and they'll get worse and well i had i thought i better have this check so finally i went the summer after i got back and i said yeah you've got carpal tunnel syndrome so they i had the surgery in september on both wrists and the ulnar nerve in my left elbow and and they're a lot better i'll probably never the tingling will probably never go away, but th- this spring on these longer rides, if it, if it gets a lot worse again, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make a decision in whether to do it or not, but that would be the only thing that would probably. Yeah. Keep you from doing it. Yeah. Keep me from doing it. Yeah. I, I don't want to go. I mean, the surgery wasn't painful, but it's just, you know, it's just not a lot of fun. So it's like I say, it's, you know, it's hard on, hard on your bodies out there doing that. And but as long as I can do it, not do too much damage I'll, I'll continue to go definitely inspiring definitely inspiring so wh- what does your family think about you doing this all the time do they do they think you're crazy do they understand well I they mean... yeah they understand it and my my son he'll he'll ask from time to time and then before when i'm out there doing it you know it's still fun dad you know i think what he's saying is that you know if it's not fun you know don't you know don't keep doing it so no i think as long as it's fun no they they get it. They know that it's a, it's a passion and something I enjoy doing. And they, I mean, you know how it is watching the dots on, on track leaders. People love doing that. Yeah. I'm sure knowing someone it's even, it's even better. Do you ever, do they ever come out and see you on the ride to to see these places? You know, just, I, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to know what it's like unless you see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember yeah. my dad told me, he's like, I just didn't understand why you like to ride your bike all across the country till I flew out to see you and you rode up to me and he's like, and then I watched you ride away and it's like, yeah. I get it now. Yeah. My daughter's been to Banff twice. 
Oh, that's not too shabby. That's a that's a beautiful area. Oh yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's honestly uh, probably among the most beautiful scenery on the whole trip. Is right where it begins. You know. <laughs> oh yeah. No, I I had a uh, had a cousin that was it was funny. She was lives in Denver and uh, was was following and came out to Silverthorne. I got there like at ten o'clock at night, and I I mentioned that my friend Philip Bird. We kind of hop you know road together hopscotch back and forth and he he pulls into he gets a civil storm before i do and my my cousin carol's a, you know following the divide race and and uh has a sign made you know you know welcome marty or something like that and so she sees the light coming up and and she's, she thinks it's me and of course it's philip and she's like you know, kind of what's going on? Where is everybody? And he's like, oh, there is no everybody. This is, you know, <laughs> this, this is, is how it. it is. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. It's like, you know, people you know, like Antelope Wells, well, what's down there? It's like, well, let me show you on Google Earth. There's, you know, there's nothing down there. I mean, over the course of 2,700 miles, 150 people can get quite a bit of distance between them. Oh. Where you're, you feel, you don't just feel alone. You are very alone. This year, I was in a bubble. I was probably, for a good part of it, I was probably 50 miles behind and ahead of other people. So I was, yeah, you've got to be able to ride by yourself um, and be by yourself for hours on end. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. It, it You do kind of group together just like any other event, but... Man, you can you can go days without seeing people, depending on your schedules and and just how everyone else is riding around you, and uh, it's ex- it's very fascinating. And people know it, you know, the communities know you're coming through, but it is not um, it, it it is not like other races where there's a you know a, a big group of people, a peloton of folks traveling together. But uh, yeah, sometimes you do get that, you know, especially if you're doing it with someone else. And technically, I know no one's supposed to come see you on the trail or help you, but man, it's it's hard. It's hard on those, you know, when 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 family offers to come see you and you're down, you're feeling pretty low, and you know it's going to lift your spirits. And and, and, that, and that's why it's cool when someone comes up on the road and gives you a thumbs up. Yeah, absolutely. You know that they're your they're your fan. Ab- you know, some thumbs up, some little honk can can just change your whole day. Yeah. And that is, you don't, you don't think the little, the smallest little pleasure, the smallest little piece of beauty or just lifts you right out of your, right out of your dark little hole and, and get you back on it. I'm now I'm just excited. I want to go do it. I want to go well, do it. this year. <laughs> come on. I know I, a- I, I won't be able to this year, but, uh, definitely, definitely has been on my mind for sure. You know, one thing, you know, we talked about the preparation and, you know, like on all these events, you know, people are, you know, whether it's a marathon or that or a through hike or whatever, people that have done it encourage other people to do it. It's like, you know, if you think you want to do it and, and I'm the same way, you know, same story. If you, you ever think you want to do it for sure. But, you know, be prepared. And, you know, and that's certainly a big part of it. And I remember I think it was even I think it was in 17. I you know, you get all your stuff together and um, you, you get your your baby wipes and everything, you know, for your hygiene. And I was riding along and it's like, you know, I don't feel real comfortable down there. And I was several, and it was a couple of weeks into it or whatever. And I look, instead of buying baby wipes, I'd bought Clorox wipes. <laughs> so, you know, it, I guess the point is, is there's so many details you got to cover on this thing or, or you, you could be in yeah, trouble. <laughs> you could be in serious trouble with a little mistake like that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That is too funny. Oh man. So you know, let me let me let me, let me ask you this: do, do you have a hard time adjusting back to normal life for the rest of the year? You do. Do you kind of enjoy those two different worlds? You know it. It that's interesting because I, I enjoy the two worlds, but yeah, it it can be. Uh, I don't say difficult, but I, you know, there's something too about getting back into the swing of things. I haven't put my finger on it. You know, you come back and of course you kind of eat everything in sight. Oh, um, yeah, you're, you're grateful for running water and you know, toilet uh, and a cup of coffee whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. But no, it, it, it takes some time to get. And I mean, even more than just uh, a couple months, it, it, you know, it might take, Several months. I probably 
affects uh, people different ways. But no, it, it takes some time to kind of get back into the swing of things and into some normalcy, I guess. What, what's the biggest misconception that you hear about doing these long trips, maybe from people back home or just online? Um, oh, it's a misconception, but and it, it's hard to follow a lot of the social media when you're out there and all the a lot of the drama. And then there certainly was a lot this year, but it, you know, it's there's a lot of armchair quarterbacking going on. In what regard? People saying like, oh, well, just what just drama? Like, I, I, I didn't follow too. Oh, there on. was yeah, there was some drama with uh, a film crew out there being on on their route. There's just a lot of second guessing, but you know, people will, they, it's easy for people to follow, you know, why is, and I think it's more with the leaders, but why is so-and-so stopped at, at this point? You know, why did they, they're second guessing the writer's decisions that they make on the, on the route. And unless they've been out there doing it, it's, it's hard to, for people to be too objective. You know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You know, it's just, you know, unless you've been out there, you're on your, you've been on your bike for 14, 15 hours a day for how many days? And why are, why are they stopping here? You know, it's, why aren't, why aren't they getting up? I've had people that will say, you know, how come you don't start earlier in the morning? It's like, well, man, I, you know, he's just, I don't set my alarm to get up and, and you, and you wake up feeling like you got hit in the, in across the, the back with a, a truck. It's hard to just, and you're, and it's freezing. And you're wet, and it's 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 hard to get up and just get yeah. moving. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've um, yeah, I've taken a bivy the first year. I've taken um, a tent the other years. I think just a little more shelter. But yeah, it's just you're in that warm environment, and it's just like, yeah. I guess that's the thing people say. How can how can you're, and and I don't sleep until eight nine o'clock, but. You know, when the sun comes up, I'm getting up and getting around. But, you know, some I know the fast people, they're getting up at, you know, four in the morning and going. And it's just, you know, they're younger and and uh, have a have a different goal than, than what I do. So. Interesting. Yeah. And, you know, the, I, do, I haven't even talked about this yet, but uh, one reason you might not be moving is because, heck, I remember one time we were stopped for like 15 minutes because there was about 300 cows in the way. And yeah. they all looked like they weren't happy with us and there's no fences and there's just, you're just in this open plane with hundreds of cows that can chase you oh, down. Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, what do we do here? Cause they're just the whole clusters right over the trail and we can't really go around them or go through them. So you just kind of have to wait. You know what I mean? Do, yeah. do you, have you had experiences with animals? Cause I felt like when we did it, my buddy and I did it together, uh, uh, I just felt like every other day we were narrowly escaping some sort of animal encounter. And so doing it five times now, I'm sure you've had your fair share of encounters. Yeah, you know, I, probably the the main one I remember is uh, in New Mexico, you know, there's black Angus from border to border and, you know, free range, but there was, it wasn't, it wasn't that many, but there was, I don't know, a couple dozen. And as you rolled up, most of the time they, they move out of the way. But this one, the bull, he was standing his ground. He was standing in the middle of the road. And it's like, okay, dude, I'll I'll walk around, I'll go around you. And and like I say, there's no fence between he and I. And it's just like, you know, I'm not a you know, I take bear spray. I'm not really afraid of the bears or any other animals, but yeah, those get trampled by cattle wouldn't be fun. I think it's probably more dangerous than the wildlife that's out there. Absolutely. I mean, I think cattle kill more people than any animal in the world and people just underestimate how dangerous. Yeah. I mean, it's bigger than a bear as far as size and weight. And there's a lot more of them. Yeah. We had a, we had a guy I probably around that area is just somewhere in Montana and we had caught up to him. He had fallen off his bike and broken a couple ribs, but he, you know, he could still ride, but, uh, he was an older gentleman and he said that it, this bull started chasing him and he was, you know, trying to make his way through this crowd of, of cows and 
he picked up a rock and said he threw it at the bull as hard as he could. But when he did, it kind of engaged his, his core and, and just <laughs> pain shot through his abs. And so he said, I threw, I was about halfway through my throw. And then I just kind of let go of the rock and screamed in pain. And he goes <laughs> and the rock flew straight towards the bull and hit him as the bull was running towards him. He said it hit his toe. The, 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 the rock just right as the bull's hoof was on the ground, it just hit it. And he said it, that bull lifted that foot up like it, like he had just stubbed his toe and just <laughs> hobbled off the other direction limping. And and he says, I, I think probably would have killed me. And I just, yeah, like, man. holy man, cow, man, shot. are you narrowly, uh, I mean, that was the David and Goliath situation. You narrowly escaped. That's <laughs> and funny. I just think like, it's this is a dangerous this is a dangerous adventure man so so you it's really just the cows for you too nothing not nothing really extreme no 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 bear encounters nothing with bison well, or anything I, like that i was um it was in idaho and you go you're off that rail trail and oh, there's gosh. the uh, yeah yeah and which is and i with the lava rock the, the lava rock and I'd gotten to the Wise River campground like at midnight. I looked in one of those one of those campsite bathrooms, you know, latrines to sleep in. It's like, nah, I'm not gonna sleep in there. So I put my my bivy out. That was the year I took my bivy. I, I bid put my bivy out. I get in the bed, and right and it's light there. There's a an area light. So I'm laying down. Have my bear spray out. And we had been told that that's kind of like grizzly alley because it's close to Yellowstone. And, mm. and so I, I'm laying down there and asleep and I feel something like walking across my, my legs. It's like, Oh man. So I grab my bear spray and I sit up and I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking the worst that there's this bear that's out there. I hadn't heard anything, but there's a skunk walking over my feet, over my, <laughs> over my legs. It's like, Oh man. So I sit up and he luckily he didn't spray me. But I give him a shot of uh, bear spray as he's running away. Oh gosh, a little taste but, of his own medicine. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is too funny, man. I, you know, I've seen a couple of grizzlies, but not nothing up close. And one time was by a paved road, and there were probably half a dozen cars just stopped there watching this grizzly just foraging around looking for food. So you know, they don't they don't really care about humans. And now, you know, what, is there any sort of gear that, or, or any sort of creature comfort that you take with you on these long adventures on the Tour Divide? Anything that you just got to have? Probably no creature comforts, but in, with my gear, I've, you know, I use a Dynamo Hub and it. Mm. And, and for folks that don't know that, that can charge things and power things. Correct. Yeah. It's um, the front hub as it turns, it makes electricity and it it'll you can there's a little charging device you can plug your us it's got a usb port on so you can charge your a spare battery your phone your your gps your computer or, or whatever headlight and, or headlamp or whatever yeah and, and this year i used it was a sun hub it was a german hub it was a, a good hub well there's two little wires inside that hub that that had broken it, that, it, sometimes they can twist in the in the fork and it had done that and it broken the wire. So I was without the ability for my front hub to produce electricity. So it turned fine. Oh gosh. So I, so I, so I had to buy a, a battery operated light and, and long story short, I called uh, the manufacturer and had them make another one for me on, on the route. You know, it wasn't cheap, but it's just, you know, I guess it was a kind of a, it was reassuring. I would n- never run out of power. Yeah. Um, I always have light. That was kind of how my model, that was my, you know, my plan. It had it shipped to in the steamboat and then sent my bad one back and had it, had it rebuilt. But, you know, I, you know, probably that I try to take, you know, I, I'm taking a, you know, a one person tent now. And, but no, I, I don't take a lot of extra gear, just one pair of shorts and one jersey and a long sleeve t shirt and a poofy coat and rain gear and, you know, bladder enough for, for water. And I still take a, a filter, you know, or the first year I, I probably carried too much water or mm-hmm. more water than I needed just cause I, I didn't want to run out of water and you, you know where the water stops are now. And up North there's, even when I would collect water, I'll, I'll still filter it, but there's water up 
first half of it, you can get water pretty frequently. Like I say, just down in New Mexico is where it's not as available. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you, that's, that is one beauty of doing the, the route over and over is you can kind of know where you can trim the fat in your kit and also just, you know, save, save, save weight, which can, you know, go a little faster, go a little lighter, which can make right. the experience, whole experience more enjoyable. So, right. um, absolutely. I, I definitely, if I ever did it again, there's a lot I know now that I, yeah. I did not then. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. But, uh, so let me ask you this, you know, if, if, if there's somebody out there who might be, you know, maybe, maybe they got an opportunity or at least a window of opportunity where something like this might be possible, you know, you may, but you may, may, may take a little rearranging, moving around. What, what do you say to the people who have an idea to do something like this, but maybe no experience and, but the desire to, you know, like yourself? Yeah. Just like we we're saying, you know, I was, you know, for sure, whatever that is, I would, you know, encourage them to do it and just, you know, start out slow, small, um, with shorter o- overnight rides, you know, load your stuff on your bike and you're going to take too much and with you and, but you'll end up figuring out what you, what's necessary and, and do it and then go do a week long ride and do it self-supported. And there's rides out there around wherever someone would live that pick a route that, where you've got to manage your water and food, but yet if you get in trouble, you can always make a phone call and get home. There's, you know, there's routes or now there's gravel rides about anywhere, but you know, just, just start small and, and don't let the failures or the non-successful rides discourage you. I know my first dirty Kansas, which is a 200 ride mile ride in Kansas. And they've got stops every 50 miles. Well, my first year I did that, I stopped at mile 45. I was five miles from the rest stop and, and got a ride in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I just, you know, don't, don't think those things are failures. Just, just view them as stepping stones up to, you know, whether it's the doing the divide or whether it's a half marathon or whatever, just, you know, work towards it. And, and the sense of accomplishments just, it's going to make it worth it. That's for sure. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You know, that's a good point because a, a lot of people, I feel like try something new just just one time goes horribly horribly and they never try again and yeah. the people that can at least try one more time i don't know what the stats are i don't know even how if that can even but i guarantee they have a a a 75% chance of it com- being a completely different story and enjoying it immensely. I mean, I that the first time I mountain bike, I hated it because I just I, I fell a th- fifty times, and I was like, "What the heck do people do this for? This is miserable." But yeah. it was just a really technical route, and I was totally unexperienced. My balance was horrible, and did it one more time, and it was a totally different story. And I just can't tell you how many times, how many things in life are like that. You try it the very first time, and you are awful at it, and then just doing it. Just try it again, maybe two or three times, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh man, okay, okay, and you know, start seeing start seeing some progress, and the next thing you know, you're you're biking from Canada to Mexico, yeah, six times, <laughs> and, and you know, and, that, and that's the thing about you know, you can take so many lessons from the divide or whatever it is that in that you're using your early life, just like in our our business mm. in the garden center business, it you know we rely on you know twelve ten weekends in the spring for good weather well there's a lot of years we don't get those good weekends and it's you know it's we're getting a, it's nice during the week but the weekend it rains and our you know our sales are way down but you know you just can't give up just like on the divide is you know it's wet and rainy or whatever you just you know keep going and finding a way to persevere and you can just use those analogies in, in all aspects of your life you you know this as well as anybody that's ever been on this show you cannot predict the, the good experience and the bad experiences where they fall on it because so many times they are just butted up right against each other you know it's like the worst day the worst morning and the w- most wonderful evening are the same day like it happens so many times and, and you just at some point the odds are going to turn in your favor if you just keep going well, that's why i say you know there's there's always a, a payoff for this struggle 
this hard time, this, absolutely, you know, this sum or going up to this summit or, or whatever it is. It's just, you know, once you get up there and, and sometimes you get up there where you think is the, and it is a summit and you think, well, that's going to be easy going down. We get to the side. It, it, it's going to be a rocky road. Now you leave yep. Brush Mountain Lodge and go up over that ridge. It's like six miles of, of, of rough terrain going down. So, it, you know, it's just, it'll, it'll come, but just, you know, sometimes it's at the least expectant time. Absolutely. So how can, uh, how can people find out more about you, Marty? I know you, uh, I know you like to, to write about your experiences. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a blog and, and I, my daughter, I, mentioned her the other day i said well we need to, need to get this one uh, posted but it's bucket ride dot bike bucket ride dot bike yeah bucket ride like a bucket list but bucket ride and it is dot dot bike and it i've got recaps of of the different years on there and that's or on instagram i post a lot of pictures on instagram and its name or handle is got chili c-h-i-l-e Perfect. On Instagram, I post a lot of pictures and the Flint Hills and, and rides. Yeah, I see the my, my the blog, the bucket ride has a lot of the information about about the rides. Perfect. Well, Marty, man, I, I really appreciate you being on and just telling us a little bit about your experience uh, of of doing something really really fun, really unique, really you know out of the box for a lot of people. And so, uh, you know, I hope it inspires somebody to get out there and, and do something exciting for for their life yeah it uh and like I say you know me first one was at age 60 and you know as long as you're you know don't don't wait too long but as long as your health and it may not happen when you're young and if but if you're older and still able you're able to do something get out there and do it awesome marty thanks so much man and i, I really appreciate you being on and, and good luck this year going out there. I will be following your blue dot. <laughs> All right, Mason. Well, thank you. And I uh, love the podcast. I just started listening to it and some very interesting individuals on there um, with a lot of great stories. Thank you. Yeah, we've, we've had some uh, over the 600 episodes. There have been quite the vast majority are, are absolutely incredible. It, it has been a lot of fun over the last few years for sure. Yeah, I enjoy it. Well, good. Well, Marty, have a great night, man. And uh, yeah, stay warm and Looking forward to, to June. Can't wait to follow All right. you. Yeah. All right, Jason. Thank you. All right. Yes, sir. All right. Bye. Bye. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. <laughs>